Hello, fight fans. Welcome to Five Rounds. I am your host, John Ramdeen, and with my usual partner in crime, Robin Black, on vacation in sunny Mexico this week, we're bringing you another Best of Robin's Breakdowns edition. Let's kick things off with alpha posturing as Robin explains that the animal kingdom and the mixed martial arts world might be more closely related than you think. It's John Pollock here alongside Robin Black, and we're chatting about the Fox card from Saturday night in Sacramento, California. And we chatted about it a bit before uh, the break. And a fight, Robin, can be a really interesting thing. For my namesake, it can kind of be like a Jackson Pollock painting, where you can watch a fight, and we're all watching the same thing, but we interpret it very differently. And one of my favorite interpretations is what Robin Black <laughs> takes from a fight, and you have a doozy today. Oh, thanks, my friend. I really appreciate that. Yeah, I loved watching the fight between Uriah Faber and and Michael McDonald. And the interesting thing that I was finding is that uh, Uriah Faber calls himself Team Alpha Male Leader, but he really expresses himself physically like an alpha male. It's been something I've been paying attention to is how guys' body language affects their fight. And that is the breakdown. And I have either lost my mind or I'm onto something really interesting here. Could be both. We look at Uriah Faber and we look at how his body is expressing himself. You see the confidence, you see the way he's moving, but I want to look at his nonverbal expressions of power dominance. What on earth are you talking about, Robin Black? Well, first, let's look just at his fighting stance. That's not the thesis here, but let's take a look. His feet are nicely positioned with the ground for power, his hips are sprung, and his hands are up nice and high. But it's not what he's doing here, it's how this posture affects power dynamics. And if we go to the animal kingdom, you can see clearly here which is the alpha animal. And the, uh, the silverback on our right here is puffing his chest out powerfully, the one on the left is weaker. We look at the cobra, you see how he spreads himself to appear bigger and intimidating, and it's clear which of these animals is more intimidating. And Uriah Faber uses this, a lot of fighters do. Amy Cuddy, a social psychologist from Harvard University, has studied something called power postures in business and in public speaking. And power postures affect the posturer as well as the intimidated viewer. And the right intentionally powerful body posture makes the individual more assertive, more confident, and more optimistic, as well as increasing abstract thinking and risk taking. So you can see how Uriah Faber is performing here. And this power posturing affects physiology as well with measurable raises in testosterone, which is the dominance hormone, and decreases in cortisol. So what I'm saying is not only does he intimidate his opponent, but he performs better by having the right body language. And there are lots of other examples of this. Donald Cerrone, when he was facing Pettis. Look at Pettis. Pettis is there. He's intimidating. He's physically sending the alpha message. So badly so that Donald Cerrone said, there was so much wrong going on in my head. I remember looking across the ring like, dang, I done pissed him off, and he's coming hard. That's what Donald Cerrone's brain was telling him from the messages that Cerrone was sending. And Cerrone's performance really showed it as well. Got Cerrone out of there in the first round. So what did Donald Cerrone do? He did the hard work on the couch. He found the right sports psychologist. And look at this. He's walking. He's swaggering. He's confident. He's sending a message. And we saw it in his next performance against Evan Dunham as he swaggers across the, state, uh, across the cage, as he's sending the alpha message. And he really puts it on uh, Dunham. He puts it on Dunham and intimidates him physically. But he also, his confidence and his movement makes him perform better as well. It's a brilliant, mind-blowing thing, but imagine being able to just tick your opponent down a little bit and also increase your performance. And we see it right here in Cerrone's performance, and we've seen it in a lot of guys. And look at this animal right here. That is a guy who knows he's just been the alpha, just like Uriah Faber did this weekend. Uriah Faber, the ultimate alpha male. Except for the minor details. Yeah, what did they all have in common? They were spectacular, and they each had one dude knocking out another dude. We all love to see that. But they were different technically, and they each showcased a different set of skills and a different specialty out of the fighter who won. These ones were a real pleasure to break down any time that you have you know, some really dynamic knockouts it is. And that's the breakdown this week. Three strikes and you are out. Start with uh, Joseph Benavidez. Team uh, Alpha Male has looked phenomenal. Look at this. Starts with the level change and some feints and changes his stance. It's been a thing Bang Ludwig has added to all these guys. See that level change? Then watch. He enters beautifully, brings the right hand first, then the left. Here we'll see him change stances once, maybe twice even sometimes. Gets Formiga guessing. Formiga doesn't know his intentions. Look at how he's beautifully slipping as well. There's another change and then enters. It worked beautifully for him and it's worked for all of the Alpha Male guys. 
Here we see him just suggesting that knee, lands the left, makes, makes Formiga miss, and then lands the right hand. Just worked beautifully. Look at that left on the exit. His timing is excellent. His control of distance is excellent. He did throw a few kicks in this fight, but really he set this all up with his hands. There we see again, strike, miss, strike. And when this fight was uh, be ready to be put away, just landed a beautiful combination. And that is the first and only knee of this fight. He waits till he has him injured. He manages the distance, closes it, hurts him to the body, and boom, one more to the head. Beautiful finish. Team Alpha Male moves to 17 and 0 since Dwayne got there. Phenomenal. Jacare fight. This one was spectacular. Look at their feet. Jacare's left uh, foot is on the inside of the right foot of Okami. You always hear, keep your foot on the outside against the southpaw. But here, Jacare is inviting the left hand of Okami. He wants that left hand there. Watch. See? You just see, he gave away his plans a little bit, but it doesn't matter because Okami is not ready for the right hands that follow. He's inviting the left of Okami, ready to slip it and counter with the right hand. When he does, you see what he can do. And here we see it again, staying on the inside. When the hand doesn't even come, it just flinches, he fires the right hand. Whether you throw that left or you just suggest the left, you are gonna eat a steady diet of rights and it's the only thing on the menu and it's dessert right here as well as he puts his man down. Beautiful fight, man. He had one loaded weapon, cocked throughout that fight. Okami knew it, was hesitant, but he just wanted the left to come so he could finish that fight with the right. And look, Jacare, <laughs> alligator, crocodile, killer. Beautiful, beautiful fight. And this one was interesting as well. You know, with Bader, you know that he has certain weapons, and one is the left hook. He's put men away with that left hook, and there it is. And Glover Teixeira was aware of it, but he ate it nonetheless. That's how good the left hook is. He also has a guillotine you got to watch out for. Here's a counter left hook. He had Teixeira hurt. The knock against Teixeira is he eats too many punches sometimes. But you know what? He's so good in the chaos. And watch him here. You think you have your man hurt? You think this might be the end? Baby, this is the end for you. Look at that. And when we look at it in slow motion, man, look at Teixeira's eyes. He does not look like he is under pressure at all. He's getting a drink out of a water fountain, and he's waiting with a loaded right hand, boom, over top of the upper cut, puts it away. When you think you have him hurt, that's when he is the most dangerous and you are about to be put away. Have you ever wondered what makes a complete fighter? Stick around after the break to find out as we bring you more of the best of Robin's breakdowns here on Five Rounds. Welcome back to Five Rounds Fight Fans. This is the best of Robin's breakdowns. You might want to bust out some pen and paper for this one, folks, as Robin lays out the ingredients that make up the complete fighter. She started the conversation of, well, what actually is a better fighter? That's a weird conversation to have when you look and you go, well, you know, this guy just beat you for almost 50 minutes in a row. Can you be a better fighter than him and lose like that? And we have discussions all the time about exciting fighters, talented fighters, shutdown fighters. So I thought it was time to actually take a moment and really break down what makes a, a great fighter and what makes a complete fighter. So let's take a look. It's nerd time again. Now we used to compare and contrast a fighter's striking with his wrestling and his jiu-jitsu and try to determine how complete he or she is. But come on, man, it's 2013 and we have two decades of analysis to draw on. And we know there are a lot of elements that come together to make up the complete fighter. So let's take a look at some of them. Pure skills. Well, the full picture of their fighting abilities. Again, sometimes we talk in generalities. Striking, wrestling, and jiu-jitsu, but we need to look at everything. Open guard, hand fighting, head movement, trends and submissions. A modern, complete fighter has elite skills everywhere. And a couple of fighters with off-the-chart attributes in these uh, skills would be Jose Aldo, Demetrius Johnson, and George St. Pierre. Not surprising, all three are champs. Now we got to look at physical traits. Now, if we look at which key attributes are important to compare to determine a fighter's quality or completeness, his physical traits are, of course, tremendously important. Sometimes we use the catch-all term athleticism, but this category deserves a much closer analysis. You know, does he have any genetic advantages, like long limbs or a high density of fast twitch muscle? How has he or she developed his physical tools like power, speed, explosiveness, agility? What's the fighter's aerobic and anaerobic capacity? And there are many fighters that come to mind with 99th percentile physical traits, like Uriah Faber, John Jones, Jacques Carre, John Dodson. Lots of good guys. Fight IQ. That's a big one. 
So you got all the pure skills, but do you know where, how, and when to use them effectively in a fight? And as importantly, do you know when not to use them? Fighters with a Mensa level fight IQ will experience a fight as kind of a living, breathing thing. And there are two subsets of fight IQ, strategy implementation and the ability to adapt and improvise. Now some fighters build their own strategies, but these days they're most often built with a team of coaches. And the key is being able to implement your strategy in real time, under pressure, blood in your eye, burning legs when it counts against the best in the world. And when and if your strategy is met with resistance or it doesn't work because your opponent is showing you something very different than you prepared for, can you adapt and improvise? If game plans one, two, three are all failing, can you find the tools and the techniques to win the day? The smallest champ and the biggest champ, Demetrius Johnson and Cain Velasquez, both have extraordinarily high fight IQ and both are expert at implementing their strategies and when necessary, adapting and improvising on the fly. Now, mental strength. This may just be the most important element of the complete fighter. So many mental aspects at play in mixed martial arts. And when you compare fighters for completeness, you have to look at what kind of game day performer they are. You have to look at how they handle stress. You have to look at how they compete when they're down on the scorecards. Do they control their aggression properly when they need to, but become the full alpha when it's necessary to win? Do they use their emotions properly? Can they psychically affect their opponent like a, De a Diaz brother or Ronda Rousey? And how do they process pain? And are they truly unwilling to break? Chris Weidman used his elite mental strength to beat Anderson Silva. Rich Franklin is mentally unbreakable. And Rousey has shown extreme mental fortitude. It's been one of her greatest strengths so far. And of course, the intangibles. There are some special aspects that fighters have that cannot be bought, cannot be learned, and cannot be taught. Guts and heart like a Diego Sanchez. A granite chin like a Sam Stout or a Roy Nelson. A high tolerance for extreme weight cutting like a Gleason Tebow. Unwavering workmanlike determination like the Healy brothers. An inclination for risk taking behavior like Joe Lozon or Henan Burrell. There's so many intangibles that make up a great fighter or a complete fighter. It's too many to list here. But when we compare and contrast fighters and try to determine which one is better and who's more complete, it really is an incredibly complex game that we're playing which is what makes it so much fun. But he also brought an incredibly interesting psychological fight to it. Now there's the physical fight, and we saw that unfold, but there's a bit of a psychic battle going on anytime you get two great guys into the cage. And I think that was the more interesting fight in this one. And let's take a look at that. It's breakdown time. These guys, you know, on paper, this was going to be a killer of a fight. And last week, we looked at Allenberger when we had tried to figure out how to stop the juggernaut. This guy just keeps coming and coming. Aggression. He's just letting everything fly, and he's dumping so much energy into that first round. But this fight really started four or five weeks earlier when Allenberger stepped outside of his comfort zone and started trash-talking Rory McDonald. And I don't think this guy realized the psychological impact on yourself of doing that. You have to deal with the fact that you now have these extra subconscious fears going on and you got a kid standing in front of you and he's fearless and I love this. He steps up at this last second, takes this moment to push a psychological chess piece into the cage here by standing with his fists up with Herb Dean. Remember this guy? Remember this monster that you got to deal with? Man, well what happened to this guy? This isn't the guy we faced. Instead, we got a very tentative Jake Ellenberger. Now was he tentative because he didn't want to end up on the highlight reel of a guy he called a fruit stick publicly? Was he tentative because Rory stood up to him so much in the lead up? Was he tentative because of all these psychological pressures? Well, whatever reason he was tentative, Rory came in with a game plan designed around these feints and designed around landing that left hand on the charging Ellenberger. When Ellenberger never charged, the purpose of that left hand is to get him to hesitate. Well, he started the fight hesitating. So for Rory, this fight was already going his way from the very, very beginning. It's almost a bit of hypnotizing. You can get a guy to play your game. That doesn't look anything like Jake Ellenberger in the cage now. It looks like a Rory McDonald sparring partner. All of that is the psychological warfare in the lead up and that fearlessness and the fearlessness of stepping down. And once it starts to unfold, this is just performing jab surgery on a guy's retinas. Moving around, managing the cage, but he also really managed the intensity and he managed the pressure in there. You can see Jake feeling the pressure. You can see Jake hesitating as jab after jab after jab lands. Whereas Rory, on the other hand, doesn't hear the boos, doesn't feel the pressure, and is able to go in there and win a very interesting interesting psychological battle and come home with a win. 
The parade of breakdowns continues after the break as Robin looks at the epic heavyweight clash between Mark Hunt and Bigfoot Silva, so stay tuned. Welcome back, Fight fans. Ram Dean with you here on Five Rounds, the best of Robin's Breakdowns edition. Let's keep things rolling as Robin dissects one of the best fights of 2013 between Mark Hunt and Antonio Bigfoot Silva. This was an instant classic, this fight, between two monsters that both came to just perform at the top level with everything that they had. And somehow the two of them could sense it was gonna be the perfect night. And at the beginning of the fight, it was all about strategy and technique. You don't often see that in a heavyweight fight, but that was the deal. From the very beginning, Bigfoot had a strategy of using the kicks from the outside. Black belt in judo, black belt in jiu-jitsu, this was about his karate black belt. As he used those kicks, from the outside, kicking to the head, to the body, and to the leg, smashing up Hunt. But Hunt had a great strategy too, and that was blitzing from distance, entering with the left hook. And the beauty of this matchup was how in conflict their strategies were. Neither one uh, guy's strategy prevented the other guy from employing his. You can kick from the distance, and I can blitz my way in. We can both use our offense, and it was a beautiful back and forth round one and two. And at the end of round two, Hunt had a really, really damaged leg, and he had to change this up, and he made it about attrition. And attrition is using constant pressure to wear, wear down an opponent. And that's what Hunt did. He started wrestling. He put his weight on the big man. He pushed him against the fence. He shoved his head in there and he grinded and grinded. And even when he's being taken down, reversed it. You cannot overexpress how exhausting this kind of back and forth round is. Striking to the takedown, striking to the clinch, and just making Bigfoot carry all of that weight. Attrition, wear him down, tire him out. And it changed the complexion of this fight, and so did this, the big straight right hand, boom, down the pipe. You know, when you're hit, being hit back and forth, you're putting a guy flat on his back, and we'll see here as he's gonna trap the arm in this half guard as well. You see it right there. See that trapped arm hammering away on this guy through rounds three, and in round four, Bigfoot got some of that back. When you're gonna end round three on top of a big man and end round four with a big man on top of you, man, that is a scary, scary back and forth round. Hunt got his, his licks in in round four. Bigfoot stands up, reverses it, works against the fence, you can see how tired they are, and ends round four with Bigfoot hammering away on top. We've had 20 minutes at this point, and now it is entirely about heart, guts, and will. Both guys are tired, both guys' bodies are smashed, and they're gonna stand here. They got energy for either offense or defense, and both men put a little tick in the box next to offense, and they go for it. You end up with Rock'em Sock'em robots standing in here trading. This is what fans love to see. And if you don't understand that this happened because of the hard work that they did earlier, you're really not being fair to these fighters. Yes, their hands are down. Yes, the technique is sloppy. But that is because it was a war of attrition in rounds three and four, and a war of strategy and technique in rounds one and two. And here in rounds five, it's going to end up with these two just standing in here and giving it everything that they have. A beautiful fight, a tale back and forth of all types of different things and ending with a beautiful draw. UFC in Brazil, it was littered with submissions while the Brazilians have decided to say, you know what, we're not defined by Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and they mixed it up delivering some outstanding knockouts. Yeah, some beautiful knockouts, and every knockout is different. They're like an individual snowflake, a big, hard, mean snowflake that bludgeons you unconscious, and we saw some spectacular ones. Last time, like you said, we wrote a little fan letter to great submissions. This time, it's a thank you note to some great, great knockouts. And we're gonna start off with my personal favorite. Honey Jason here got starched by Little Heathen. And this one is beautiful because it was so set up and so planned. We see Heathen here just working his way in, using feints to set up this hard right hand. He's gonna drill it down the pipe, touch, and boom. But look, he misses. The head is so far out to the left that he's slipping the right hand. But that is the moment he decided to knock this man unconscious. The exact same setup, but instead of the right hand, the kick to the sliding head out to his left finishes him off. That is 
a guy who's on an absolute another level. Look at this. Head all the way out to the left, made him go that way, and drilled his shin into his head. Just a beautiful, beautiful finish. But man, there was a lot of them. And this guy is someone to watch for. He's going to have a lot in his career. Hey, you want to fight this guy? This is a scary dude. But he is not afraid. Plays with range at first because the goal is to get in close, fight inside a phone booth where he has a nasty clinch, nasty elbows and knees. And look, he's moving his head nicely there, fighting his way in, not in any danger, and trying to smash the body up. And we looked at him and did a breakdown in the past, and he moves so quickly, sometimes you have to look in slow motion to see the key techniques. And this key technique coming up, my buddy Colin, our editor, spotted this right up underneath the armpit. That, to me, was the knockout uh, kick. Because here, yes, that knee finished it off, but first you fried the left side of his body and then smashed him to the right side. And here this man is tapping. And do not judge this man. You would tap too. This is His body is in absolute agony. And that is a beautiful, beautiful step knee to finish him off. But man, they kept coming. We also broke down Fei Zhao's finishing instincts in the past. And man, he put him on display here. It was a real simple game plan. He wanted to fight his way into the tie clinch, which clearly is something he's been working on for this specific opponent. Watch this. Gets it, and it just goes to work. And uh, you can count them. One, two, three, four. Five, six, seven, oh, and then just brutalizes him. His body is destroyed and wrecks this man. Man, that guy has as good a finishing instincts as anybody in the combat sports world, but of course, this was the big one. And really, you know, obviously Vitor, phenomenal, moving amazingly, but this is uncharacteristic of Dan Henderson. Watch as he hesitates right here, realizes he's not there, instead of throwing the left hook behind it, is floundering around in outer space here, and he gets lifted off the ground with that nasty left hand uppercut as Vitor faded out to the side. Watch this, change his angle. See that slight angle change? Under the armpit, boom, feet off the ground. Henderson somehow kind of lived through this, gets back to his feet. Oh, dude, are you kidding me? Ah, oh, he lived through that somehow though, but uh, that will go down as his first KO on his record and Vitor just capped the night off. Amazing night of knockouts. That is all the time we have for this week. Be sure to tune in next week as Robin will be back with a tan and ready to analyze all the action in the world of mixed martial arts. Thanks for watching. I'm John Ramdeen, and we'll see you next time.